Thank you, Ms. Browning. Appreciate that song. Very beautiful and encouraging words. So definitely gives us something to, to think about and dwell on. So let me ask you a question. Start off with a question. Get us thinking here. Think back in our maybe our, our childhood, or some of us might be chi children now. But let me ask you a question. Is life fair? Is life fair? I'm sure that sometime in our past, maybe in our recent past, we've said life is not fair. Whatever happens, life is not fair. And sometimes, you know, life is not fair. At least not all the time, but sometimes life is fair, just to be fair. <laughs> Are you confused yet? <laughs> <laughs> well, think about this. Somebody commits a capital crime. Somebody kills someone. Somebody shoots someone in the worst way. The crime is investigated, okay? And the suspect is found and arrested. The defendant is on trial in court and is convicted by a jury of his peers. And as a result of the unsurmountable evidence the convicted has to face the sentence. That's fair, is it not? Well, sure, that's fair. The person broke the law, and the law punished that person for their violations. This is not only fair, but our society functions somewhat better and more effectively because of this. This is godly, so it's fair, right? Okay, consider this, a young person who decides to pursue, pursue a preferred career option in their life. They do extremely well in college. They're accepted to this college because of how they did in school. So we see a pattern here. So they attend the college of uh, their choice and they excel in the college. They graduate from college with high honors, applies for a job, and they eventually get the job, the job they wanted. And they have a stellar career. Okay? That's fair. Right? I mean, they worked hard for it. They were dedicated. They stayed the course. It paid off. A just reward for discipline and hard work. Right? I mean, we can agree to that. But even as we agree that some things in life are fair, we know that some things in life are not fair. In fact, many things in this physical life are not fair. Let me throw you out a couple examples here. Probably most of us are old enough to remember firsthand September 11th, 2001. Nearly 3,000 people lost their lives through an act of terrorism. Probably every one of us in here can tell where we were and what we were doing at the moment we heard this. These were people who were just trying to earn an honest day's pay for an honest day's work. These were children. These were peace-loving people. These were business people, daycare workers, service workers, firefighters, policemen, the list goes on. People who not only did not deserve to die, but they certainly did not deserve to die such a horrific death. The way it came down. That beautiful, crisp September morning, I remember it to this day. That's not fair, is it? Doesn't seem to be fair at all. Martin Luther King Jr., while pioneering the ideas stated in our Declaration of Independence, he was assassinated by a man who had absolutely no concern at all for fairness. None at all. A man who dedicated his life, Martin Luther King Jr., to freedom and equality and dignity for all not just for a few, but for all. He was cut down by a man 
who had absolutely no concerns for anything, didn't care if the sun came up or went down. Is that fair? Such unfairness makes you and I angry. And sometimes we cry out. One of the very first lessons that we teach our children and we learn in life is the fact that, guess what? Life is not always fair. And yet, most of us cling to the belief that people generally get what they deserve. How do we work that out? This belief influences our expectations and it absolutely can cause us to view the world as, as a serious, or a series, I should say, of transactions. Think about this. You put a dollar, maybe a dollar fifty, depending on where you go, in the pop machine. A pop comes out, right? You work hard. I mean, you work hard. You dedicate your life. You should get a promotion. You treat others with kindness. So they treat you with kindness in return. These expectations are not at all unreasonable, but they often go unmet. Sometimes we put a dollar, a dollar fifty, in the machine and it jams. We work hard every day. We get up early. We're the last first ones to get to work, last ones to leave. And guess what happens next? The promotion goes to our neighbor sitting beside us in the next cubicle. We're kind to the other person. We practice godly love. And they turn into the jerk down the hall. <laughs> That's how they treat us. When there's a gap between what is and what we believe should be, we tend to get angry. I don't deserve this. I don't deserve this. But dwelling on unfairness absolutely does not make life more fair, does it? It does, however, make it extremely difficult to think rationally and to keep you and I our focus on the problem instead of the solution. We don't always get to choose what happens to us, but we do get to choose how we react. And there's the difference. We must be careful of the seed of discontentment. And there are a bunch of them out there, and they're planted in front of us. I want to start by looking at a few examples in the Bible. You might turn to Genesis chapter 3. We'll start there. This is right from the very beginning, right from the Garden of Eden. Adam and Eve apparently thought God was unfairly keeping them from partaking of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. They seemed happy to submit to God's commands to begin with, but after Satan tweaked their pride just a little bit, their actions cultivated the first seeds of human discontent. Notice Genesis 3, and verses 1 through uh, 6 here. It says, Now the serpent was more cunning than any beast of the field which the Lord God made. And he said to the woman, Has God indeed said, You shall not eat of every tree of the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, We may eat of the fruit of the, tree, of the trees of the garden, but the fruit of the tree which is in the midst of the garden, God has said, You shall not eat it, nor shall you touch it, lest you die. Then the serpent said to the woman, You will not surely die, for God knows that in the day that you eat of it, your eyes will be open, and you will be like God, knowing good from evil. So when the woman saw that the tree uh, was good for food, that it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree desirable to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. She also gave to her husband with her, and he ate. 
Is life fair? Is God's expectations fair? Keep that in mind. Let's go to 1 Kings, another example. 1 Kings chapter 19. First Kings chapter 19 here, we witness that the prophet Elijah's discontent after fleeing from Jezebel's threats, imploring God to take his life. He implies that he had served enough. Wow. He had served enough. And he had suffered enough. He's telling God, God, I've done enough. What more do you want from me? I've served enough. I've suffered enough. Come on, God. This, this is what he's saying. For God to ask more of him was simply unfair. Look at verses, uh, 1 Kings 19, verse 1, 1 through 4. And Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had executed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a message to Elijah saying, so let the gods do, more, do to me and more also if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. And when he saw that, he rose and he ran for his life. And he went to Ber uh, Beersheba, where, or which belongs to Judah, and left his servants there. In verse 4. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he prayed that he might die and said, It is enough. Now, Lord, take my life, for I am no better than my father's. So it seemed that Elijah was having those life is not fair moments. <laughs> Haven't we all had those? Sure we have. Consider the actions of Jonah. Let's turn to Jonah chapter 4. Right after Obadiah. Jonah chapter 4. Jonah, who displayed his indignation over God's will for him regarding Nineveh, to begin with, when God directed him, and this is Jonah 1 verse 2, I'm just going to read it to you, he says, go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. His initial response was to flee the opposite direction. Haven't, maybe we all face that once in a while in our life. Then, after relenting and submitting to God's direction, Jonah displayed further discontent and pride when he cried out against God's merciful sparing of this great city. This is a little further, Jonah 3, verse 10. And then, later, when God destroyed the shade plant, Jonah, much in the manner of Elijah, he begged God to take his life. Apparently, God's mercy, think about that, God's mercy was too unfair for him to bear. That's what you have to deduct from this. So Jonah 4, starting in verse 3 here. Chapter 4 begins with Jonah being very mad at God. He's very mad because God didn't destroy Nineveh. So in verse 3, this is Jonah's request. Jonah 4, verse 3. Therefore now, O Lord, please take my life from me, for it is better for me to die than to live. Put me out of my misery. That's what he's saying. We we'll drop down to verse six. We kind of do a little, fill in the story a little bit here. Six through nine. And the Lord God prepared a plant and made it come up over Jonah, that it might be shade for his head to deliver him from his misery. So Jonah was very grateful for the plant. But as morning da uh, dawned the next day, God prepared a worm, and it and it so damaged the plant that it withered. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. We can almost understand that, can't we? It's hot today. 
if you stayed out there very long, you, you could see what he was feeling. We we'll go on then. Uh, then, this is Jonah, then he wished death for himself. And he said, it is better for me to die than to live. Look at verse 9, what God said to Jonah. Then God said to Jonah, is it right for you to be angry about the plant? He called him out. And then Jonah replied. And he said, it is right for me to be angry even to death. How many of you want to go up against God in that manner? <laughs> Down through the ages, brethren, nothing, absolutely nothing has changed. You know, uh, as God is the same yesterday and forever, mankind is too. You know, things we do today, things we think, things that we try, all of our ancestors have tried it, thought it, done it. It's, it's very interesting when you read certain scriptures and it calls out what they've done to show you and I, okay, you know, we're human. We have these thoughts too. It's not the first time these thoughts have been had. They've been had through you know, great people down through time. Straighten up. <laughs> That's what he's saying. Straighten up, people. Come on. The outcome won't be what you think it will be. I mean, you know, Jonah here, you know, go ahead, God, kill me. Take me out of this. I'm done. I, I, I've served enough. Um, I've suffered enough. Guess what? A big fish is lurking. <laughs> All of us, when we get this attitude, remember that. A big fish is lurking. Down through time, again, nothing has changed. And people still remain, remain discontented, considering their lot in life unfair. Can we find correlation between this and all of the sins? The Bible, one of the biggest sins it talks about is adultery and uh, all kinds of crimes. Adultery seems to be the, the one that uh, the world, everybody, the world um, ignores. They ignore this the most because Satan knows that if he can get him to ignore this, this is the way to disrupt, break down, destroy the family. What does the Bible talk about from Adam and Eve all the way through Revelation 22? Family. God is adding to his family. He wants to add to his family. So Satan wants to disrupt the family. Most people marry with the best intentions. Not all, but most of them do. But they, too, often become discontented. After some maybe perceived slight from the spouse, then armed with the alleged accusations, they justify seeking comfort in the arms of another. That's how they work it. Murder, theft, violence of any kind, it all takes place on a daily basis. All you have to do is turn on the TV, turn on the internet, and you see history that happened 10 minutes ago on back of all this. You, uh, all this list can be found there. And much of this occurs because the guilty party has thought the circumstances of their life that led to their actions, guess what? It's unfair. It's unfair. In fact, people from all walks of life, rich, poor, sick, healthy, from stable homes, unstable homes, everybody can fall victim to this common disease of discontentment. All this by simply thinking, life is unfair. I've been singled out. But even though we all complain of injustice in our lives, not all turn bitter, and not all turn to the life of crime. Why is that? You ever think about that? If we contemplate the parable of the talents, I'm not going to turn there, but I recommend you read that in Matthew 25, verse 14 through 30. We learn that two men generously given multiple talents by their master and recognizing 
that these talents come with additional responsibilities, they felt compelled to use them to produce even more fruit. Think about that. At the same time, the one was given fewer talents. And because of that, an easier assignment with less responsibility. What happened? Produced nothing but bitterness. The fact is, this idea of unfairness, anyone can find grounds to complain. Anyone. I could go down and pick everyone here and give me something to complain about, give me something to complain about, and everyone here would have an item on their list. The thing is, brethren, there's always perceived injustice to be found, and there always will be in this world. But does that perception really provide legitimate grounds for complaining? The next time we get ready to complain about something, think about that question. I want to consider one more example. And it will take us just a few minutes to get through that. This is the example of Job. So if you will, go ahead and start turning to Job chapter 1. We'll consider here a little bit of the life of Job. And as we're going through this, I want you to put yourself in Job's place. Job chapter 1 and verse 1. There was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job. And that man was blameless and upright and one who feared God and shunned evil. So he didn't just fear God, but he, he walked away from evil. He put evil out. I, I'm assuming by reading this, if a thought, a, a sinful thought entered his mind, he evaluated it and dismissed it. That's how we put evil out. Verse 2. And seven sons and three daughters were born to him. Also, his possessions, think about this, his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household, so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So what we see here, this section of script reveals that, first of all, Job was blameless. He was upright. He shunned evil. And he feared God. These are the ingredients to be a successful Christian. He goes on to say here, by reading this description, he was a successful businessman, without a doubt. He had ten children, and he owned a great deal of livestock. The last part of verse 3 says he was wealthy. He was the greatest of all the people of the East. I don't know how many people that was, but it was more than 10. <laughs> it was more than 20. It was several. But even while living a blameless life, Job lost it all. And he lost it all for one simple reason. Because God allowed it. God allowed him to be burdened with perhaps the greatest trial ever given to any man other than Jesus Christ. If ever a person could protest, life is unfair, it was Job. He had all the rights. Even so, confronted with enormous, almost unspeakable torment, without any understanding as to why this was happening, or even how long this trial, this series of trials was going to last, he refused to cry out against God. He refused to cry out and say, foul, this is unfair. Have you ever had one of those days where everything that can go wrong does? We call it Murphy's Law. <laughs> the alarm clock dies in the middle of the night. The electric goes off. So guess what? We oversleep. 
the doorknob comes off of the bathroom, trapping you inside. I've never had that happen, but I've heard of it, so I don't know. But the toaster burns our breakfast. Now, as Debbie can attest, tell you, to me that's not a problem because I like burnt toast. <laughs> but we cannot find our keys. You know, we've had that happen. Um, but when we do, guess what? Our car doesn't start. That makes us late for work. So what happens then? You're late for work. The boss questions you. He even maybe threatens to fire you. The air conditioner on the way to work quits. The air conditioner in your office quits. The toilet backs up. And while arguing with your spouse about all this as you're getting ready to go to work, when you crunch down on that burnt piece of toast, you break a tooth. So, yeah, that's a bad day. As bad as all that may seem, such trials are actually quite frivolous in the light of what poor old Job went through. Job. You've heard the expression, well, you need to have the patience of Job. <laughs> Absolutely. After Satan challenged God concerning Job in Job 1 verse 11, the story continues, and it continues with full reports of increasingly tragic news. So let's pick it up in verse 13, Job 1 verse 13. Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. Now keep these in mind. Put yourself in Job's situation here. Verse 14. And a messenger came to Job and he said, The oxen were plowing and the donkeys uh, feeding beside them. When the Sabians, if I pronounced that right, raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of a sword. And I alone escaped to tell you. Verse 16. So that's one. Verse 16. While he was still speaking, so this servant is still reporting to Job what happened here. While he's still speaking, another servant came and he said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them. And I alone have escaped to tell you. That's two. Verse 17. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of a sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. So first, let's just summarize this. A band of rebels, they got together and they stole Job's oxen and his donkeys. And they killed it doesn't say how many, but a large number of his servants. But before Job could finish digesting this section of bad news, trying to process it, another one runs in, and he exclaims that the fire of God had burned up Job's sheep, killing even more servants. Again, we don't know how many, but a lot more. Then right on the heels of that message, Another one, a third man, came rushing in to report that now the Chaldeans, they had conducted a, a, a set of raids, of violent raids, stolen all the camels, and killed even more servants. Job, can you imagine? He probably thought, what is going on now? What's next? Can you imagine getting that kind of news, one right after another after another? But as awful, as awful as that news was, the worst was yet to come. While Job was sitting, still reeling from all these tragedies that he had heard so far, trying to process, trying to make sense of life, of what's happening, what's becoming of his plantation, his kingdom, whatever you want to call it, a fourth messenger comes in. 
And look what they declare in verse 18. It says, While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. So that confirms what the first one said. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are all dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. We can only wonder at the emotion that Job felt as he listened to this most distressing message. All these first three wasn't bad enough. And then this one. You know, for those who have lost a child, there is an immediate state of unbelief. A heartfelt denial that such a thing could be true. And while deep down realizing that it is, you have to start processing. Then, usually, a dark, unfathomable thought, emotion, being, well arises, filled with emptiness, anguish, anger even, and many other uh, emotions that we process that would cause even the strongest to shout out, this is not fair. Life is unfair. How many of us could lose everything as Job did? All that we are proud of, that we call our own, and then avoid accusing God of life being unfair. How many of us could do that? At times, our torment can give way to discontent or even, at the best, displeasure with God or the human governments that he empowers. We, we see this probably on a daily basis. It can overwhelm and dominate our minds and our thoughts if we are not careful. To a lesser extreme, even a simple viewing of the nightly news Flip it on for 10 minutes. That can spawn thoughts of grievance or outrage against God. Why are you letting this go on so long? What do you hope to gain? Brother, we better be careful in doing that and having those thoughts. We need to dismiss those thoughts. God has a plan. God is working his plan. And not every aspect of his plan from the human aspect, the human perceptive, is going to be pleasurable. In such moments of our weakness or our vulnerabilities, Satan absolutely loves to catch us off guard. That's when he's, he orchestrates these things and then he hits us. If we leave God's sovereign will out of the picture, even momentarily, for a split second, we leave ourselves open to our adversary's ability to fill our minds with thoughts of inequity or lack of fairness, if you will, that seems to so easily be justified. But as we should learn, for our own benefit, God will occasionally remove a portion, not all, but a portion of our protective hedge, just as he did with Job here, allowing Satan to get at us to do the things that Satan thinks will hurt us most. But God allows this so you and I can be humbled. That's the only way that we can go to God. That's the only way we can be in his presence, through humility. All Satan's malignant hatred for God 
and for man, especially God's chosen people, is displayed in what he did to Job and what, brother, he may do to you and me. And all this is as the end approaches. We are in the last days. We don't know how long they'll last, but we're in that period, especially in the view of the fact that God is, or Satan is targeting God's called out ones. Satan doesn't have to worry about the rest of them. He worries about us because we are the ones that God has put his name on. Go to Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6, <clears throat> look at verse 12 and 13. We're very familiar with this section of Scripture. This is a, a warning for every one of us. Ephesians 6 verse 12, For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness, in heavenly places. And then he says, because of this, or therefore, take up the whole armor of God. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day, and then having done all, to stand. First Peter 5, 8 talks about that as well. While we may justifiably consider some things in life to be unfair, it is interesting to see Job's reaction to all that has happened to him, all that he went through, all the events as that day started piling up on his shoulders. Go back to Josh. I should have told you to keep your place. Sorry about that. I didn't keep mine either. Job chapter 1, verse 20 through 22. Job 1, starting at verse 20. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground. And what did he do? Did he scream and cry unfair? No. He worshipped. All of this happened. The, the, the weight of the world hit him like a ton of bricks. And what did he do? He fell to the ground and he worshipped. And then look what he said. Naked I come from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. In other words, God, this is all yours. I have no right to it. I, I appreciate you giving me this, and I thank you for giving me this, but it's all yours. That's what, essentially what he was saying here. He goes on to say, the Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. What a great attitude. Do you and I have this kind of an attitude? In all this, Job did not sin nor charge God of doing wrong. Again, what, what, a, what a great attitude this man displayed here. In the following chapter, in Job 2, we see that Satan, obviously very disappointed with Job's righteousness, Job's reaction here, goes before God to challenge him again. So look what he says in chapter 2, verse 4 through 6. He says, skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. However, put forth your hand and now, or put forth your hand now and touch his bone and flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. So look at the answer here. So the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your power, but don't kill him. Spare his life. Can you imagine the freedom that God just gave Satan against Job? Basically, he's saying, you know, do whatever. The ends are open. Push him right up to the point of death, if you will, but don't kill him. 
Satan must have waltzed out of the throne room of God uh, like a millionaire, like someone who uh, all of his dreams just came true, delighted at the prospect of thinking, now we'll see. Now we'll see how faithful Job really is. By the time I'm finished with him, when he loses his health, he will become exhausted and weary from all the agonizing pain, all that he's going to go through. You know, I'm just you know, paraphrasing what Saint might be thinking. He says, then, then we'll see God if he doesn't curse you. So, while Job was still grieving all this great loss, this loss of not just his um, physical things, his sheep, his goat, his camels, his oxen, but his children. God allowed Satan to ravage his health. In many ways, you know, this is probably one of the worst trials that a, a man or woman can face. A person can usually cope with all sorts of losses and failures, given time. But once a person's health uh, really seriously starts to fail, then that person has to devote the majority, if not all, of their time and efforts in finding and maintaining their strength, managing the pain, focusing on life's most basic needs that is absolutely necessary for life to continue. Job was in misery. He was in misery. Satan caused him to be covered with boils from head to toe. Now, probably, I don't know how many, has anybody had a boil? Some of us have had a boil. And we know what one boil does. It's excruciating. You're, the section of the body that has this feels like not just that little section, but that section is on fire. And it takes forever to heal. And it oozes. There's all kinds of things that goes on here. But look here at Job 2. Verse 7. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord, and he struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. And he took for himself a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of ashes. Can you imagine how miserable? Job must have felt. Again, those of you who have had a boil, you know what one will do. Can you imagine having them from your feet to your head and going through all that, the pain, the agony? So in verse 9, Job's wife, finding him sitting in the midst of the ashes at the local garbage dump, she scornfully utters, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Surely, such an outburst would provoke Job's pride to denounce God or, or even his wife for being unfair. Instead, Job's reply in verse 10 reveals his humility. It reveals his self-control, his patience, his faith in the face of adversity. Look at verse 10. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speak. Shall we indeed accept good from God? And shall we not accept adversity? So he's saying, listen, it's God's offer. He gives us good and he takes away. He said this earlier. He said, should we not accept it? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. You know, despite what had to be an overwhelming assault on his emotion, his physical, and yes, his spiritual state, Job refused to reprimand anyone but himself. He abstained from crying out 
Life is unfair. God is unfair. He didn't say that. In fact, throughout the account of Job, he maintained his loyalty, and his reverence towards God in the face of all that he had to endure, including help from three well, <laughs> well-meaning but very misguided friends, Job remained faithfully steadfast. So I've got a few questions here. Are we like Job, accepting of our lot in life without complaining? What do we do when we are cheated or lose something or even someone that we love? How do we react when something we desire passionately is withheld from us? Are we willing to accept God's will graciously? Or do we focus instead on our discontent and how unfair life is? Brethren, God knows what our individual needs are, every one of us. He knows what they are physically and he knows what they are spiritually. And he promises to provide. Let me just quote Philippians 4, verse 19. Philippians 4, verse 19 says, And my God shall supply all your needs. But he doesn't stop there. He says, According to his rich, uh, riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Not what we think, but what he thinks, what he knows. And accordingly, he withholds things that he thinks will not be good for us. Do we accept his decisions? Or do we allow the bitter root of discontent to form in our hearts and in our minds, and then we act on it. You know, all too often, Satan will feed our minds with such arrogant um, discontent, knowing that if he can persuade us to see ourselves as the victim, then he has a chance to devour us. Again, that's what 1 Peter 5, 8 says. Here's the thing, brethren. We should never underestimate Satan's power, nor his hatred for God and for man, especially you and I as God's uh, called out first fruits. He secretly broadcasts his evil spiritual intent into our minds, subtly working to turn each member of the little flock away from God. We should carefully consider the account of his actions. Let's go to Ezekiel chapter 28. Ezekiel chapter 28. Verse 12 through 16, because this is his modus operandi, if you will. This is the way he operates. This is how he thinks. This is why he does what he does. Ezekiel 28, starting in verse 12. It says, Son of man, take up lamentation, uh, lamentations for the king of Tyre, and say to him, Thus says the Lord God, You are the seal of perfection, full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering, the sardis, the topaz, the diamond, beryl, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold. The workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were created. You were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. You were perfect in your ways from the day you were created. And this is where it changed. Till iniquity, sin, lawlessness was found in you. By the abundance of your trading, you became filled with violence within, and you sinned. Therefore I cast you as a profane thing out of the mountain of God. And I destroyed you, O covering cherub, from the midst of the fiery stones. Although nothing was withheld from him as he was created by God and as his ultimate beauty, the function, everything was perfect in his ways, 
he didn't remain true. He did not remain true. Turning away from God. This is a picture, a perfect picture of cancerous discontent. In verse 17, we just, we didn't read that. We're going down to verse 17. We see the source of this uh, discontent and it's pride. It says, your heart was lifted up because of your beauty. You corrupted your wisdom by reason of your splendor. Satan was full of pride, the very thing that we absolutely must guard against so that we do not corrupt the wisdom that God has given us and is giving us and will continue to give us. Satan is called an angel of light because he has a talent for presenting evil in good light, which can confuse and absolutely will confuse and deceive us if we let our guard down in any way and we drift from the, God, the truth of God. Without this truth as our guide, we can very easily, brethren, fall prey to the very darts that Satan is throwing. That's the darts of discontentment. After all of this, we have to understand that today you and I live in Satan's world. And we have to do this for a little while longer. So while we continue to witness the, the growth of discord and discontent based upon false notions that life should always be fair, we should anticipate and be thoroughly prepared for life, occasionally and even frequently, to be unfair. For now, that's all going to change. But... As we heard in the final stages of the age of man, and we're, we, we're there, we don't know how much longer we have, we have to understand that we need to keep in mind that each of us, brethren, each and every one of us was created by God, complete with everything that we need to function according to his will. Not ours, but his will. And while we may lack the power, or the wealth, the talent, the beauty, or whatever it might be that Satan or perhaps even our brother has been gifted, we will soon be given much more. If, among other things, we learn to be content with what our generous, loving Father has provided for us now. Sometimes that's the hard part. We should always remember that discontentment is common and hurtful, while contentment is rare, but it's very beneficial. 1 Timothy 6.6 6 talks about that. I'm not going to turn there. Also, brother, we need to remember that true contentment is a byproduct of the gift of faith that each and every one of us has as the elect. It's been granted to us by God. What a great gift that is. Paul reminded us in 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. 2 Corinthians 10, verse 12. says that we dare not class ourselves or compare ourselves with those who commend themselves. This is a warning. But they, measuring themselves by themselves and comparing themselves among themselves are not wise. However, brethren, we absolutely should instead only measure ourselves by the very word of God and the example of Jesus Christ. And if we do that, we'll be all right. In doing so, we will discover a proper perspective, finding peace, security, contentment, all that that we need within reach because that is in God's sovereign plan. I want to finish with one last section of scripture. You go to Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4, read verse 6 through 11. Notice what we're told here in Philippians 4, starting verse 6. 
Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Finally, brethren, whatever things are true, whatever things are noble, whatever things are just, whatever things are pure, whatever things are lovely, whatever things are of good report, if there is any virtue and if there is anything praiseworthy, meditate on these things. The things which you learned and received and heard and saw in me, these do, and the God of peace will be with you. And finally, verse 10 and 11. But I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at last your care for me has flourished again, though you surely did care, but you lacked opportunity. Now that I speak in regard to need, for I have learned in whatever state I am to be content. Brethren, like Job, our focus needs to be on, or I should say it needs not to be on what seems to be fair, what we possess or what we lose. But our focus absolutely needs to be on God's promise, all of his promises for our future. And when we take possession of the most incredible, indescribable gift of all, eternal life with our just and loving God and our eldest brother.